Okay, y'all, so here is my presentation on psilography. I'll just shut the door here. Okay, uh, psilography. One, once upon a time, if somebody had a disease of the salivary glands, they would inject contrast in order to, to be able to kind of see, because the, the salivary glands don't show up on a regular x-ray. And so you have to get some contrast in there. And a lot of times they use just a tiny little amount of oil-based contrast. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so silography is a radiographic examination of the saliva glands. And the anatomy we're going to take a look at. Um, there's the parotid, the submandibular, also called submaxillary, and then the sublingual. And these glands are all paired. You know, so there's, there's one of these on each side. Okay, and so this is this doesn't sh this just shows like on one side. So this big gland right back here is the parotid, and then down here below the the level of the mandible is the submandibular, and then under the tongue are the little sublingual glands, two of them, and they sit side by side. Okay, now some duct work. How do we get the saliva out of the glands and into your mouth? Well, the sublingual glands kind of complicated. There are 12 ducts, um, six on each side, I believe, if my memory is serving me correctly. Um, and these feed in under your tongue, and these, these openings are tiny. They're really, really small. Now, the submandibular gland, it, it just has one passageway leading into the mouth, and this is called the submandibular duct or Wharton's duct, you know, named after some doctor that was working on it back in the day. And then the largest, the parotid, also has the largest uh, opening. And this duct is called Stenson's duct. Okay, indications for silography. Why would we do this? Well, a lot of times obstruction. <clears throat> Excuse me. Just like you can have stones in your gallbladder or your kidneys, you can also have stones in your uh, saliva glands. Um, there could be strictures, which that's any time you've got one of these ducts that's being cl um, like clamped off by either deposition of uh, some kind of detritus in the gland, um, you know, that's causing it to, to get narrower, or there could be a growth near the gland that's cutting it off. And what would happen here is that somebody would have a lot of um, like really, really dry mouth, uh, or um, or pain in their pain in their jaws coming from these glands. Now, something else: um, the silectasia. This is the abnormal dilation of a duct, um, probably due to it being blocked off. And then there can also be fistulas. Uh, fistula anywhere in the body is just an abnormal communication, um, you know, between tubes that normally should not be. Uh, so, for example, if somebody had a hole in their, in one of these ducts, you know, there could be a fistula opening out, like into the throat or something like that. Okay, contraindications for silography. If somebody's got severe inflammation or a bad infection, as always, we're going to medicate them with an antibiotic and then have them come back in later. You know, we'll, we don't necessarily cancel the procedure. We're just going to delay it a few days until the patient can get under control. And then if somebody's allergic to iodinated contrast, then as you know, that's generally a showstopper. Okay, here's an example of somebody with a really, really swollen parotid gland on one side. And this is what the parotid gland looks like once the contrast has been injected. Um, as you can see, it's, it's like a cluster of little balls because the um, the saliva glands are not just like a hollow pocket full of spit. These things are composed of little subunits. Um, they look kind of like little clusters of grapes. And those are actually where the saliva is generated. And then they all kind of join together. And the saliva ultimately winds up going through this duct and into your mouth. All right, contrast medium. Typically, this is going to be something like Isoview or Omnipaik, uh, you know, something that's very, very safe and known to not 
react with the patient's body. Um, now, you could use renographin or cyanographin. Those, there's no reason why those wouldn't work just fine uh, for most people. And then something else uh, that we use from time to time is an oil-based contrast. Um, Dr. Rosenberg always wanted to use a thiodol. A thiodol is an oily contrast that is buffered so that it doesn't really uh, react too much with the patient's body and it's uh, he had a lot of success with it. Okay, preparation for this study. HMP, history and physiology always, you know, and ask the patient why we're doing the exam. If they've got any removable dental work, um, you know, false teeth or whatever, and then let the patient know what's going to happen. Um, tell them that when the doctor comes in, he's going to have them open their mouth, and then he's going to probe around in there trying to find um, one or more of these ducts. They, they can be kind of challenging to find. Um, but they use something called lacrimal probes. Lacrimal probes are really, really fine instruments that um, are typically used around the, the duct work of the eye but they work just as well for these uh, silography studies. And the reason you have to call central stores in advance is because the lacrimal probe tray is a sterile, uh, it's a sterile tray that they have to prepare and so you have to let them know that you're going to need it so that they you know make sure that they have enough to go around. Okay we only look at one gland at a time here um, Dr. Rosenberg always wanted us to do scalp radiographs and we would do like a, normally we would do like a slight oblique and then a lateral with tight collimation just to see if there's any uh, stones or any, any cause for concern there before the doctor would go in and actually start doing, um, start probing around for these glands. And that's this business right here, the silolithiasis. Sil that's a stone. Um, it could be blocking up the passage, so, you know, doctor would just have to decide whether or not to go ahead with the study. Uh, dilators. Um, this is the lacrimal probe business. Uh, the doc will, like, take one of these and, you know, maybe, maybe start with a really, really skinny one and then gradually work up until he's got the duct uh, stretched open enough to introduce one of these, um, catheters. And down in the lab, I've got some silography catheters, and they're kind of interesting. Um, I think the ones I have are the Rabinov. Uh, you can also use something like an angiocath, you know, like a, um, what do you call it, like a 30 gauge or something like that, something really, really skinny. Uh, the silagogue, that is typically just like a little pack of lemon juice. And what happens is um, we give the patient this lemon juice to suck on, and that helps dilate these ducts and really get their saliva flowing. And, okay, this is a little cartoon picture showing the, the catheter into Stinson's duct, and then we can um, opacify that uh, gland. Okay, doctor will do fluoros. You know, you may need to drive, depending on if the doctor's hands are both busy. And then for follow-up, after the patient's done, if the doctor wants any of these follow-up images, then he'll let you know. It could be that they don't need any, though, because nowadays our spot films are so good. You know, the spot films um, are darn near as good as the overheads, so a lot of times the doctors don't need any overheads. Um, tangential AP. This basically is um, almost like a AP view of the, like you would do for the sinuses, but except for we've got the CR down at the mandibular angle. And, you know, just keep in mind, what are we shooting for here? Well, depends on what the gland we're looking at. That dictates which images you're going to take. Now, for the sublingual gland, this SMV uh, with occlusal film, this is something that we typically don't have the ability to do. They would be able to do this... Um, uh, what am I trying to say? In a dentist office, you know, dentists have DR systems with image receptors small enough to go into the patient's mouth. And then once again, lemon juice, um, if you give the patient lemon juice, then that's going to help flush out the uh, contrast from the gland. 
and complications not many uh, we could we can always cause an infection you know because it's just the nature of our business oily contrast can possibly cause granulomatous reactions um, especially in people with Sjogren's disease um, which is an autoimmune disease that causes the salivary glands to enlarge and malfunction and here's an image of somebody's parotid gland. Back here's the parotid gland. Remember the biliary tree? This kind of resembles that. Okay, and you can't see it in this image, although if you look kind of close, you sort of can. The functional units of the salivary gland are like these little sacs, um, and then they feed into these ducts, which ultimately you know, feed out into this larger duct. And then here we are. This is that tangential AP I was telling you guys about, where you're basically just shooting past the mandible and through this gland. And here's an image of the submandibular gland. And you can see, well, why do they call it the submandibular? Because it's down here in your neck, sort of. It's, you know, it's well below your mandible. And you can see it really well on this image. Okay, here's the, here's the inferior portion of the mandible and then here's this duct down here below and you can kind of see those little pockets um, where the saliva's developed produced okay uh, some more here's another image of the submandibular gland you may or may not have to do these uh, here's another image of somebody's submandibular gland I got a lot of those apparently and then here's an image of spot films of the parotid gland. And, you know, well, why don't we do these studies more in radiography? Well, because CT does such a better job of demonstrating the pathology. So here we go with a CT scan. I think this is just a CT scan without contrast. And you can see this parotid gland all swollen up here. If there was anything suspicious in there, like any nodules or stones especially, those would stick out like a sore thumb and make it really easy for the doctor to uh, diagnose the patient's issue. So, you know, with all this CT technology and MRI, it's kind of made the silography kind of go by the wayside, which is why we don't test on it anymore. But I just wanted you guys to have this information. So just in case some oddball customer comes in and needs a silogram that you kind of know what's going on. Okay, well thanks very much for your kind attention as always. I appreciate it and hope you have a good day.